Thanks so much for joining us this week. First of all, why are you running for governor? Well, I mean, there are lots of reasons why I'm running for governor, but primarily the reason why I'm running for governor is because I believe that there is just a certain portion of the state that is just woefully underrepresented. And I believe as governor, you represent everybody, and I feel like that representation has gone notably unattended to. Do you mean that, do you mean people are underrepresentative philosophically or geographically? You could probably make an argument for both. I was referring more to philosophically, um, but I feel like uh, that there is a geographical issue there. You could m make an argument for it, but once again, my, my concern was philosophical. So what are the main issues that you are running on? Um, the main issues that I'm running on are, number one, uh, the, the economy uh, and inflation. Number two, education. Uh, I'm a lifetime educator. Number three uh, is women's autonomy. And uh, number four would be criminal justice reform. So let's let's talk about the economy. You know, Idaho's economy has been very strong the past few years compared to other states and weathered the pandemic fairly well. What specifically would you change to improve Idaho's economy? Well, the economy, the pandemic, you know, did cause some strain on the economy, but not as much as in the last six months to a year. And um, what's going to what's going to be the easiest way to affect the economy and uh, ease burdens is taxing and and part of my, the economy would be a tax reform, um, and more especially property taxes. Well, so. What specifically with property taxes would you change? I would look to restructure it so that uh, businesses carry a fair share of the taxation because they're paying about 15% less in property taxes now. And you know the average um, Idahoan makes somewhere between fifty and $100,000 a year. The, and uh, that businesses make notably more large corporate uh, in uh, multinational corporations. They make notably more money and they have the wherewith the flex to be able to pay those taxes much more than the average uh, resident here in Idaho. Detractors would say that part of the reason Idaho's economy is so strong and has grown at the rate that it's grown is because of those property tax uh, the, the lower property taxes for businesses along with other business incentives. How do you win those voters over? You know, I expect to win a certain portion of the vote over. I don't expect to win everybody over. Um, but the bottom line is the taxes, you, when, you, when you're talking the property taxes, okay, the businesses can't afford that. And right now, the property tax has been so high on the residential uh, uh, sector that a lot of Idaho's have had to sell their home because they can't afford the property taxes, homes they've lived in for decades. And to me, that's the injustice there. And so at what point are we willing to benefit uh, the businesses uh, so much so that uh, Idahoans have to sell their home and once they can't afford a home, half time they have to move out of state because they can't afford to live in Idaho anymore. You also mentioned education. In early September, the legislature came together for a special session, uh, approving, among other things, a major investment in K through 12 education. How would you suggest the legislature use that 330 million for K through 12 education and the 80 million for uh, higher education or the in-demand career training? Um, well, it's kind of laid out in the, of itself like that, but uh, within the the, the 300 million for education, I would uh, focus primarily probably about 65 percent of it on teacher salaries. Um, and that would have to be reconsidered because I don't have all the information, but I would want teacher salaries to become more competitive uh, with uh, the, the states around us so that there's not a vacuum sucking teachers out, but a vacuum pulling teachers in. Uh, therefore, I do want Idaho to become competitive so that we can get uh, more teachers not have the 900 vacancies and hopefully uh, attract you know good quality um, educators that can help bring our scores up um, my concern is you know both parties have always said education you know the top of the list but having said that for 25 years 
Idaho is still 49th or 50th in spending, 49th or 50th in, in standardized uh, scores, uh, testing scores. So whatever, you know, they, whatever's been said, um, the results are not agreeing with what's been said. And we need to make it so that, it, that we need to make that change. So you say 65% of the 330 million should go into teacher pay. That's about $170 million additional to what we've put in the career ladder so far. Is that a guaranteed way to, to boost the test scores and to improve things like the go on rate and math scores that have been such a concern for parents across the state? Is it a guarantee? No, but <coughs> It's, it can easily be said that, you know, and I'm going to give an example that to help understand, it's not going to be a realistic example, but it helps you understand. One teacher, one high school teacher has 40 students in his class, another high school teacher has 10 students in the class. Um, how much uh, teacher to student time will the, the teacher that has 40 students have in relationship to the other teacher that has 10 students? He's going to get a lot more uh, teacher time. Okay, the average high school class right now in Idaho is about 30 to 35 students. Um, the average uh, elementary school uh, classroom is typically around 25 students. And that's, you know, I've been, I've been in prison education for 15 years, so that, that could have changed that dynamic. I'm, I'm speaking of 15, 20 years ago when I was still in the public sector. And so um, if you can reduce the number of students uh, in a classroom, uh, you will increase the, the, the contact time, one-on-one -on -one contact time with teacher to students, n indisputably. So right now, Idaho had 900 teaching positions unfilled last year. Th what, well, how they handled that, they simply spread those students out into other classes, made the classes larger, less contact times. So will, will it help uh, with the overall scores? It will, but there are many aspects uh, in, to the dynamic of raising a test score, whether it's math, whether it's language, whether it's reading. And so th that's just one aspect of the overall uh, dynamic of raising test scores. And we will, you will see it, it would nudge it a little bit. You have to influence other things too. You also mentioned reproductive issues. Uh, it, regardless of what happens in the general election, we know that we're going to have in Idaho a Republican majority in the legislature because Democrats are running for fewer than half of the legislative races in this state. How would you get your proposals on reproductive issues and reproductive access through a legislature that has definitively said that we are anti-abortion? Um, well, first off, if I don't like what comes to my desk, I simply send it back to them. <laughs> that's, that's the easy thing. And I say, you know, when it's acceptable to me, then it will pass. You know, I am actually moderate. And so, you know, for all practical purposes, uh, it's not going to be much of a fight. You know, I, there are things that I, I think conservatively on. There are things that I think progressively on. Um, and so getting, you know, getting the two sides to, to align I don't think will be that hard, um, uh, but the bottom line is, is you know, if they don't want to work with me, uh, it brings things to a standstill. Uh, I don't see the legislature as not wanting to work with me because um, you know it's it's not productive uh, to just say we're not gonna we're just gonna write things that you don't want. Uh, I, I don't see them doing that, I, and, and I I have a confidence that most legislators, to some extent or other have their constituency in mind. Uh, they need to have their constituency in mind, and if they don't have their constituency in mind, they need to be replaced. You, you're talking about you know, future bills that would come to your desk if you're elected. Currently, Idaho has a, a near total ban on abortion with very narrow exceptions. Would you try to do anything to change that statute? Yes, the first thing I would do is, is I would uh, let um, the public know that I'm, you know, the, the governor is the executive branch, and I would not, um, I would encourage uh, people to, the governor would not execute, uh, the, you know, follow through with the ruling. I would, I would relax 
um, you know, pursuing those who violated those laws at this time. Would you have the constitutional authority to do that? Because that's up to the 44 prosecutors in each of the counties. I said encourage. I didn't say that I would make them do it. I can't make them do it, but I can encourage. Um, and yes, they, they can, and they can, and, you know, they will do what they want to do. And, you know, the governor, all he can do is encourage in certain aspects, okay? Um, I will also, as soon as I get into office, I would begin to see about procedures uh, and ways to uh, rescind those laws. I, I don't know what the process is now, um, but I would, you know, get, need to get some legal uh, counsel to find out how to go about doing it, because I would look look about, I would look to replace those laws which were more agreeable to both sides. I, you, you mentioned that you were an educator in, within the Department of Correction for the last several years. Uh, I, I'm curious about your approach to criminal statutes around cannabis. You've suggested decriminalizing marijuana possession, um, but not legalizing it. What's the difference and how do you think that that would benefit Idaho? I, first off, I don't think Idaho's ready to legalize, um, you know, recreational use of marijuana. I think Idaho is very ready to legalize medical use of marijuana. And uh, decriminalizing would simply mean we're not going to put you in jail, which is very expensive uh, per prisoner uh, to put people in jail. It's, it's somewhere around $100 a day to keep somebody in jail, plus the court costs of getting in there and you know all, all the costs involved, it's very expensive per year, uh, per prisoner. Um, if we just say, it's, we make it like a traffic ticket, you know, and we say, Ooh, here's, a, here's a ticket for $150 for you know, smoking a joint of marijuana, you know, all of a sudden, it not only do we not put them in jail and cost $100 a day uh, for, to the taxpayers, but it, it becomes a source of revenue also. I, I'm curious about your campaign up until this point. Um, <coughs> you know, during the lieutenant governor debate last week, there was a uh, candidate, Democratic candidate Terry Pickens Manweiler said that she wasn't sure who she was going to vote for for governor, that she didn't really know you and didn't really know your issues. I, I, I'm curious, have you been actively campaigning around the state? I have. I've made trips uh, to eastern Idaho probably a half dozen times. I made one trip up north. Um, it was notably longer. It's only about four-hour drive uh, to Idaho Falls. It's an eight-hour drive to Coeur d'Alene. Um, but um, you know, but I have been in contact with people on the north side of the state uh, as as regularly as as needed, you know, for campaign. So the an answer is yes. And I have you know been in the same meetings, you know, in, in you know, meet and greets with Terry. Um, does that mean that she gets to know me? No. Uh, ha have you been trying to actively fundraise as of right now? I think your October report said that you had raised about twenty-four thousand um, dollars compared to Ammon Bundy, independent candidate Ammon Bundy, who's raised more than six hundred thousand. Governor Little, for his re-election campaign, has raised more than two and a half million dollars. Um, how how actively have you been trying to fundraise? I have a, a person working on fundraising. Fundraising has improved dramatically in the last couple of months. Um, in the first few months, I was pretty much funding it myself. Um, you know, and you know, the funds have started to roll in. Um, have I made what they make? No. But here is the advantage. They have a lot of endorsements and they have a lot of packs that they need to attend to. If they were to win, they would need to attend to them more than the Idaho constituency, the voters. Whereas with me, if I win, I pretty much have hardly any endorsements at all. And most of those are individuals and not PACs. And so my obligation will be entirely to the voters. All right. Well, Stephen Haidt, Democratic candidate for Idaho governor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.